mute their mic microphones for the time being. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Every, everyone can, can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, this month's uh, online cell modeling seminar. Um, it's been quite a month since the last time we all met. Okay, so one, one of the motivations of the seminar is that uh, people working on um, like uh, biological modeling are all very physically distributed. Uh, and it's important that we, we find some way you know, for us to get together and share common challenges and, and solutions. Uh, so this is like a, a, a virtual seminar where everyone can connect. Um, and at the moment, this is, uh, I guess, the only way anyone is connecting. So, you know, we're in an okay position. So uh, one, of the, one of the goals of this is for us to, you know, share common ideas and common solutions. Um, the rules for the seminar are, are on the side of commenting. Uh, if you have a question or a comment that you think might be relevant, um, just go ahead and say it because odds are other people will find it interesting. Um, if you disagree with something or uh, you know have a different opinion, honest debate is encouraged. Just be polite. Um, and third, when you're not talking, mute your microphone. Okay, so the structure for the seminar as a whole, um, at least in this series, is that each month we focus on a, a different biological subprocess. We discuss the challenges and solutions that are unique to it, and then maybe how they can be extrapolated to other uh, biological subprocesses. Um, and this month we're doing the microbiome. And the, the trajectory of the seminar series in general has been to increase the scale of uh, you know, what's being analyzed. So the, the first two seminars dealt with um, protein signaling models and then afterwards uh, gene expression models. And one of the ideas is really to kind of look at how um, more complex interactions are, are built up in the previous ideas or how large scales like may be different than small scale modeling. Um, and today we're doing, I guess, a relatively larger scale model than we've looked at before, where we're looking at interactions you know, between cells, uh, maybe like, um, like a microbiome population, and also how that might interact with, uh, with like a, a human model. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Thank you for coming. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thiel. Okay. So, shall I get started with the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Let me try to share the screen again. Here we go. Okay. Let's see. Sorry. And. All right, so thank you very much um, to the organizers uh, for the invitation to present um, our work on computational modeling of um, whole body metabolism and the um, microbiome. And so the, the work of the laboratory is really motivated by trying to understand how um, the diet affects human health and how we could um, use dietary changes to remain healthier or rebuild um, the health status. And so we got interested a few years ago into that subject and we realized very quickly that when we wanted to consider the human um, health access or diet health access, that we can't really um, exclude the human gut microbiome, which is um, um, populating all the microbes that are populating the gastrointestinal tract. And so, um, hence, we kind of expanded that to the diet gut health access. And the way, we the way we're investigating um, this diet gut health access is using computational modeling, and in particular, computational modeling um, technique that's called, called constraint based modeling, which I will introduce very briefly um, at the beginning. But of course, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them um, afterwards. So the, the way we approach um, the problem here is to take existing knowledge, biochemical knowledge, genomic knowledge, um, physiologic knowledge, um, either published in literature or from experiments, 
put them together in the computer to then enable not only the constructions of uh, predictive computer models, but also the data analysis. So we use the models to analyze the data and ultimately we hope to bring that onto the level of clinical applications, even though we are not quite there yet. Um, in the computational modeling approach that we're taking, it's um, really pioneered about, well, 12, 15, um, 15, 20 years ago for individual microbes. And now we can do that for microbial communities or even um, the entire human body is to go from both the genome annotation, which gives us information about the enzymes, biochemical enzymes encoded um, by a pers um, prospective genome as well as literature information, let it be uh, genomic information, physiologic information or biochemical information, and put that all together into a um, computational framework, computer readable framework that then captures three different levels if you want the same information. One, it is really a knowledge database for the reconstructed organism, let it be a human cell or a microbe, um, similar to, um, well, it is the biochemical pathways expressed with um, the reaction stoichiometry that is um, underlying those, um, that then can be converted into computational model, but also been visualized um, through metabolic maps that have been drawn um, at the same time. And so using these um, computational models, yeah and um, the constraint-based modeling approach, we can actually go at quite large scales as I will demonstrate you. The constraint-based modeling approach is called that way because um, as opposed to other modeling techniques, we are not relying on having perfect knowledge at the beginning or all the parameters parameterized at the beginning, but rather we incorporate um, information as constraints into the um, computational model and then elucidate um, the possible states that the model can take on. So we do a major assumption here and that is that the system that we model is at a steady state now, if you think about the time scale of metabolism, which occurs in milliseconds to seconds, and at the other hand, um, the doubling time of microbes or human cells, which occurs in minutes to hours to days, um, there indeed um, metabolism is at a steady state. So the assumption is valid as long as one um, is at the right um, time scale of analysis. And by doing so, we can convert um, the mass balances, mass balance equations that are underlying these um, biochemical reaction networks into linear equations, and we can solve them very efficiently. And um, this is very similar to the seventh grade high school mathematics that you may remember, where you solve the equation system of um, 4x plus 5y equals 3, and you're supposed to be resolved that for either X or Y. And as we have um, generally less equations for mass balances than we have um, variables, a reaction flex is the system is under, underdetermined. In my example here, we have the variables X and Y, but only one equation, so we can't resolve X and Y uniquely, so we are having a dependency between these two variables. And by limiting those variables, we can limit the sets of possible solutions X and Y can take on. So for example, we can say Y can't be greater than 10 and both X and Y have to be positive values. And so that are the constraints that um, we use and those constraints we can derive from experiments. And that can, for example, represent diet uptake rates or that can um, represent enzyme capacities. Um, in order to go now from along the diet um, gut health axis, we have to really build um, an infrastructure um, of metabolic models for the different ports and we made them available through the virtual human metabolic um, database or VMH in short. 
uh, to the scientific community, but also to help us to kind of structure the information, and make it easily queryable. And um, I will show you some more details um, later on, but I welcome you to visit the vmh.live either now or later. So first we have to generate the human metabolic network very much in the um, spirit as I showed you in an earlier slide. And that was originally done in the mid 2000 by a team of researchers and um, in San Diego at UCSD and later on um, by other researchers as well, which eventually resulted in a second version and a third version of the human metabolic reconstruction had been published in 2013 and 18, respectively. And it's really a community effort where the community came together and um, collected what is known currently about human metabolism. One advantage or disadvantage um, of this reconstruction is that it's not tissue specific, it's not cell type type specific or organism specific. Originally we thought that might be easy to do. Once you have a generic reconstruction, you can just go to any cell type you wish by overlaying transcriptomic data or proteomic data. It turned out not to be as trivial for various reasons. And um, so that remains a challenge of doing that automatically within the community. The latest version of the human metabolic reconstruction is called Recon3D. It got published in 2018, and we are counting now almost for 3,300 genes, 1,300, uh, 13,000 um, reactions, and about 4,000 metabolites. So it's quite comprehensive as far as um, main metabolism, central metabolism goes. Um, secondary uh, metabolism and very peripheral metabolism are still missing and kind of comes in as applications are driving it. So one of the challenges is it's not organ resolved and hence certain applications aren't amenable really to be um, asked with this particular reconstruction. And so, and this line is really also lying the question of the diet health access. And so we set out uh, using Recon3D as a starting point to generate a whole body um, model of human metabolism. The starting point here was a human metabolic reconstruction, organ-specific proteomic data um, taken from the human proteome atlas, but also from the human proteome map, many different metabolomic data sets um, for different biofluids and literature sources were available for the different organs. This information was all compiled together and an algorithm was used to derive at once a whole body model, um, which has a comprehensive representation of organ specific metabolism um, within each of these organs. Now, importantly, as we didn't stitch the different organs together, but really we generated it as once, um, requiring the entire system and model to cross talk and collaborate metabolically with each other. Um, to give you some ideas, so this is sex specific. We have a male and a female version. The male version has 28 organs and the female version has 30. And the difference is really in the number of um, sex specific organs that are considered. There are 13 different biocompartments that are considered. Um, so you can actually give in, I don't know, can you see my arrow? Okay. okay. Um, you can put in um, a diet formulation into the mouse of the computational model, it goes down the gastrointestinal tract and then can be taken up either by the um, small intestinal cells or the colonocytes and then going through the portal vein, um, illustrated down here, into the liver. The liver then distributes it over the um, circulation, blood circulation to the peripheral organs it goes through the blood brain barrier into the CSF and into the brain and uh, the spinal cord. And equally, the kidney can, um, um, re well, can filter and later on reabsorb metabolites 
um, and either give them back to the blood circulation or excrete it via the urine. And also you have a fecal excretion. More work can exhale in the, and breathe and it can actually sweat as well. So that makes up the different um, blood or biofluid compartments. Now there are 80,000 80, reactions. So that's really, really big. And it's a system of linear equations. So it can be solved very efficiently still. And we have 56,000 or 58,000 metabolites respectively. So now those ones are not unique reactions or metabolites, but rather in each organ there can be um, repetitions. Um, as we aim to have a predictive um, model out of these um, reconstructions. So the reconstructions for us are like blueprints, like the genome is a blueprint. And then you have condition specific cues or information or constraints that then give rise to different cell types in the case of um, the human body or here um, to different, one reconstruction gives rise to different condition specific models. And here we use um, different physiological and phenomenological information to generate um, condition specific models out of these sex specific um, reconstructions. And some examples are given here, which information can be incorporated. Um, in addition to that, we incorporated metabolomic data um, to set constraints on the organ uptake rates. Um, okay, so then we aim to have a predictive model. Um, and so one way to assess the predictive potential of such a model is to compare that with experimental data. Now on a whole body um, level, that's relatively difficult. And one way um, that we've used in the past to compare that was is by investigating predictions of uh, potential biomarkers for inherited metabolic diseases. So that are single gene deficiencies within um, the human cells, genomes, that then lead to changes in uh, metabolism and um, partially very severe diseases that can be diagnosed and have been diagnosed um, worldwide through the inborn error screening programs. Um, after birth of an infant. And so one of these ones is um, well known, a phenyl um, ketonuria, which is caused by a deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase or PA. We can um, use the virtual metabolic human to kind of to, um, identify the reactions that are responsible. And we can um, generate different models, one that I call a white type model, one a knockout. And so there we knock out in silico each of the corresponding um, genes and reactions and ask the questions, are there any blood or urine metabolites that would change in silico? And how does that compare with what's known for PKU in patients? And so we predict in blood that phenylalanine increases while um, hydroxyphenylic acid and uh, phenylpyruvic acid um, increases in urine. And if you compare that with experimented data or patient reports really and case reports, indeed this is the case. And so we can do that on the larger scale and access um, how much is, a, or what is a predictive fidelity and accuracy of the computational model. And you can see that across 57 different inherited metabolic diseases and predicted and um, reported known biomarkers that we are doing very well. There is a bias um, towards um, increase of um, metabolites in vivo and indeed we recapitulate that, but we also have um, the few reported metabolites that are known to go down captured as well. But nonetheless, we have metabolites that are not overlapping and that's worse. Uh, for the investigations. And so overall, we have an 87% accuracy, and that is uh, statistically significant. And we can actually show that we perform better with the organ resolved, um, personalized sex specific models than um, with Recon 3D per se. So, in order to incorporate um, the guide microbiome, we had to um, 
accelerate the traditional way of doing those metabolic reconstructions, which been very time consuming and um, um, while we quite a lot of effort in reading um, on the reconstruction side, we had to um, accelerate this process and we uh, borrowed an approach that's well known in a genome annotation and that is um, the propagation of knowledge throughout different genomes. Here we propagated information and um, corrections really um, across different metabolic reconstructions of um, microbes. And um, we did that um, for a co um, comprehensive set of gut microbes um, where we collected um, 800 or so gut microbes, target microbes that we wanted to reconstruct. Again, in the same way I showed you on the second slide, um, using the genome annotations, but also experimental data from papers and books, um, Berkeley's reference manuals um, were available, where those data were available. We refined the uh, genomes and the annotations um, extensively and we did on the computational modeling um, front quite some um, corrections as well to minimize um, artifacts that are known to occur in those reconstructions. And so at the end, we have a set of 818 gut microbial reconstructions representing 13 different phylas. And if you're interested on the set of unique genes, that's some 600,000. Now, having this available, again, we uh, kind of uh, benchmark those microbiome reconstructions individually here on an um, average Western diet. And you can see that those um, growth rate, predicted growth rates, are um, within expected um, rates um, for these different um, families and phylas. So now the question is having both the human metabolic reconstructions available and the gut microbiome reconstructions, can we actually figure out what the different gut microbes and microbiomes could do on the host metabolome? And can we learn something more than just um, certain microbes going up or down? And for that, we developed a toolbox that allowed us to integrate metagenomic data with uh, uh, microbiome reconstructions. It's illustrated here. Um, the data in this particular slide is actually on PD data for 59 adults. Um, that is shotgun metagenomic data. We map that onto our reference set of microbiome reconstructions and their genomes. For each of the data set or data points, we took the relative abundance and created for each individual and for each sample a microbiome reconstruction containing the strain and their relative abundance as reported in the data. We um, cho can choose different diets and there's a diet designer actually for research purpose only um, within the virtual metabolic human database that permits you to put your own breakfast in and give that to your microbiome or to the human metabolic reconstruction for simplicity we used here, um, average um, European diet. And then we can calculate again, what are the changes within one microbiome um, versus another and predict different um, in silico phenotypes and kind of see in different states, health states, disease states, or the, um, diet states, what would change in the um, silico fingerprint. But um, what I wish uh, with you now is what we can do is when we impute these microbiome models into the host um, a whole body uh, model of human metabolism, and then ask the question, what are there any differences in um, organ specific metabolism that are driven by one or another microbiome and what can we learn from that. And so we did look into the brain. There's much speculation about and increasing evidence actually about the, the gut brain axis. And so here we can really using computational model to dissect what is a pure metabolic contribution 
assuming that either um, the metabolites themselves or certain precursors can um, reach the brain and then be um, metabolized. And so here we can do another thing that you can't do in vivo, and that is we can actually have a germ-free version of an individual and compare um, what are the changes associated when you um, have the microbiome present in the computational model. And so the first question we can ask is, well, what is um, the brain production capacity for the different um, neurotransmitters in the germ-free version? And here you see some um, examples. Those ones are capacity, maximal capacities, if you want. So they are not actual rates um, that a person can produce, but rather um, comparing the capacity limitations given um, the different um, physiological information that are underlying these different um, individuals that might lead to different capacity constraints. And so then the question is, if you give an individual microbiome into these um, whole body models, would the neurotransmitter um, production increase and does not vary between individuals? And in both cases, the answer is yes, but you can also see that the production capacity increases differently for the different um, uh, microbiomes. And so from there on, we can ask the question, well, which microbiomes are responsible and actually which microbes are mostly driving, for example, um, this increase in, um, in GABA production and the high variability that we observe here. Unfortunately, I don't have the slide here, but this is the beauty of having a mechanistic model that we can get back now to up to the gene level or reaction level to ask the question, which micro contributes with which pathway and this reaction and what is specific here about it and how could one potentially target um, such a microbial reaction or the microbe to either increase or decrease the production capacity of a particular neuron transmitter or another compound of interest. Um, so all our information is available, as I mentioned beforehand, in the virtual metabolic human. So you have a human metabolic resort where you can basically query the genes and metabolites, the reactions present in the human metabolic reconstruction, the gut microbial reconstructions, and they are both interlinked um, and they share the same vocabulary and the same, the same abbreviations. So you can ask questions, which metabolites or reactions are only present in human or in the microbes, or which ones are actually present in both of them. For the human side, we do have a, a metabolic map where you can overlay simulation results or predictions or omics data. We also have a disease um, resort uh, where we have collected more than 200 uh, metabolic diseases, inherited metabolic diseases, um, so far captured within the human metabolic reconstruction. And we have the nutrition um, as back where you can actually design your own nutrition or you can download um, different preset nutritions and then incorporate with the computational models. Here's one example given for lactic acid and the different information that you can obtain for lactic acid. We have um, obviously the internal um, abbreviations, but then we have detailed information for the different, um, yeah, the different aspects. We have many different external links, uh, really um, providing um, links out to other databases. We have information connected from the human metabolome database about what's known about the compound, the mole structure, and then of course, uh, where it is present in our own collection of gut microbes and um, human reconstructions. And you can visualize the compounds on the, different, um, on the maps. Um, associated with our work is also the COBA toolbox. It's a MATLAB based toolbox that allows you to easily work 
with our computational models to repeat simulations that we're doing. So we deposit our um, code base into the Cobra toolbox to enable others to do what we do and build on top of that. So in the spirit of sharing, freely sharing our resources and providing a reproducibility of our computational results. And for example, the microbiome modeling toolbox is present there, which allows you, for example, um, to investigate microbiome data, metagenomic data, um, and do personalized modeling. And with that, I think I should be out of time um, and would like to thank the team that is working um, with me together in, um, at the university in Galway, as well as you for your attention. Dr. Thiel, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, all right, we're gonna do joint questions at the end. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Avoit. <coughs> okay, hello. Let me see whether I can my screen going. Do you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So we have two bi uh, microbiome projects in, in our group. And if this meeting had happened a year later, I would have talked about our microbiome in the cystic fibrosis lung. But uh, we are not ready to discuss that yet. So I talk about uh, microbiome in uh, environmental systems and we're talking about two large bacterial communities in lakes. So I'll talk about that. So the two lakes that we have here is the United States. One lake is in Wisconsin. It's called Lake Mendota. It's right sort of in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the other lake is down here in Georgia where I live. It's called Lake Lanier. It's actually a reservoir. And um, the two lakes are very different. This one, of course, is cold in the winter. This one is very hot in the summer. So uh, while the lakes have some similarities, they also have very big differences. So we are working, uh, or here's some references uh, in case anybody is interested. The primary references are here. Here's some parameter estimation issue and the funding comes from the National Science Foundation. So the overriding issue that we have, of course, like everybody who is dealing with microbiomes is the complexity. So we have a lot of different species. Um, so we talk about operational taxonomic units or OTUs. And if we're lucky, we have rich data on those. And you can see here, it, this is actual from, from our Lake Mendota data and it goes on and on and on. So we have over 18,000 different species or different OTUs. And if you imagine that each could theoretically um, interact with, with every other one, we would have something like 300 million pairwise interactions. So the challenge is how can we deal with that? And so in, in a way we are fortunate because we have time series data actually. So people actually in, in Wisconsin went out every month and got samples from the same place, same depth and so on. And we've done the same here in, in Georgia with Lake Lanier, went out about every month and, and got samples. <coughs> and these samples have in, in both lakes between uh, 15 and 20,000 different OTUs. So, how can we possibly deal with so many OTUs? How do we do this? And what we want to know is who is interacting with whom and eventually what would happen if conditions change, if temperature goes up, if we have um, an incident where some species get extinct or whether we have a lot of um, uh, runoff from fields or human interactions, human actions. So what we did was for Lake Mendota, we took uh, nine years of ad abundances and superimposed them for every OTU. So we have one representative year from day one to day 365. The blue dots are the actual um, data points. And then we did some 
moving average, moving window smoothing with 10 days or with 30 days or with 50 days. <coughs> and there's a big difference between 10 days and 30 days, but there's not much of a difference between 30 days and 50 days. So we get these profiles for each OTO instead of a bunch of data points that are spread out over nine years. And then we said, what can we do with that? So we want to do some modeling and there are essentially, um, there, there are several modeling uh, approaches to doing that. We can try to figure out interaction networks and uh, they are constructed from correlations of the presence, absence, abundances, and so on of species, species across multiple locations or across multiple time points. Now the issue there is that these networks are typically static, so they do not change over time, which is a problem for us because we have very great seasonal changes, of course, because you know, the lakes are very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. The interactions are also um, symmetric. I should have said symmetric. So if species A interacts with B, then B interacts with A, which is not necessarily the case in, in, the, net, in the interactions we are interested in. Now we could use multivariate autoregressive modeling and that has been done in the environment. So we have a, a, a vector of states at T plus one and it has some growth and it has some interaction terms and then some input terms. And then you have typically a multivariate normal distribution as noise over these data. So this approach is quite flexible, but it has some issues too. So what we are gonna do is work with Lotka Volterra models. And you have heard about those as offshoots of predator prey models. And I go into that a little bit. So these are dynamical systems differential equations, uh, the interaction structure can change with time and they are asymmetric. So the effect of species A on B may be very different from the effect of B on A. And you can even, you can easily see that with predator prey models. Of course, one is eating the other. So the effects are very different. So Lotka Volterra models are very old in case you have never heard of them, 1925, 1926. Lotka was a biologist, a Volterra mathematician. So the mathematicians call them Volterra Lotka models, biologists call them Lotka Volterra models. Okay. So they deal with interacting populations. If you have two species, then the system is like this. So you have dx dt, you have a linear term, and then you have all possible binary terms. So x with x, x with y, y with x, y with y. Here are the interaction parameters. Here are the intrinsic growth parameters. And in general, of course, you can do that for many populations. And so the format is that we have a growth term here and then we have interaction terms. And uh, I is included here. So there is an XI square term in here <clears throat> that is sort of, if, if you like the uh, generalization of a logistic growth function where you have a linear term and then you have a negative BII with an XI squared. So the typical applications are in ecology, predator prey systems, competing populations, and so on. <clears throat> now, in case you haven't seen it, here's a typical predator prey system. Here's the prey, here's the predator. Uh, there's exponential growth. So if there's no predation, the uh, prey would grow exponentially for a while at least. Predation is given like a mass action term where you have the sort of the probability of uh, meeting each other somewhere and there's a, a constant with that. So that's a death by, by predation. For the predators, we have growth from predation because they benefited and they have natural causes where they die eventually. Sorry, this should be a P, DP. And we can, you know, solve these things over time. And we can have a phase plot where we have N on this axis and P on that axis. And then the system is going around according to these oscillations. So this is textbook stuff has been around for a long, long, long time. Now these Lotka Volterra models look deceivingly simple, but they can be very complicated. So here, for instance, is a model with four variables and you can see it has chaotic features. So each 
curve can only be predicted if you actually solve the equations. You cannot make predictions intuitively and say, well, this, this brownish red curve will be high at time 150 and 300 and so on. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But you can see how uneven these oscillations are. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what we did was we actually included environmental factors. And we can do that in two ways. We can say the interaction parameters are altered or we add extra terms in the same format. So here are these extra terms. So Xi, this Xi here is actually interacting with some environmental um, factor like temperature or phosphate or nitrides. And there's an interaction parameter and because we are those, we got rid of the linear terms because they are sort of subsumed in these environmental terms. Now, the great challenge for everybody who is using nonlinear models is the inference of parameter values. Because we have this model, we can write that down immediately, but the question is what are the AIIs or alpha IJs and what are the beta IKs? Now, the advantage here of using this lotka volterra model is the following. So here's our equation again. And we want to estimate these A alphas and these betas. And how can we do that? Well, we can assume that the population is not zero. If that's the case, we can divide by xi. So here's xi, here's xi. We can divide by it. And we get a new differential equation that has xi dot over xi. And here is a linear system. Now what we can do is we can take our data and obtain slopes from the time series at numerous time points. So the slopes are the xi dots at a given time point. We have the numbers xi at these time points. So we can estimate these things directly from the data. Now it's not easy to do that, but it can be done. <clears throat> and if we do that, we have a number here. And we have a number for every time point. So we, this ODE, this differential equation, becomes replaced by K linear algebraic equations. Because this is a number now at time point one. This is a time point one. This is a time point one. And then we have an equation time point two, time point three, time point four, and so on. And all these equations are linear. So this is a huge advantage because now we can use linear regression analysis and diagnostics to analyze these types of time series data. So to prepare for that, uh, we, we, even if it's linear, we cannot deal with 18,000 variables. It's just not doable. So instead we said, well, we will cluster the OTOs automatically into similarity groups. And of course, we talk with the biologists and they say, yeah, you can do that by phylogenetic uh, relatedness or closeness. <clears throat> so for instance, you know, there are all these photosynthetic bacterial species, put them in one group, and then the nitrogen fixes, put them in another group, and so on, so on, so on. Was that a good idea? Absolutely not. It was a terrible idea. It cost us about a year where we had absolutely no results. In retrospect, it's clear why. So for about 80, 90 years, it has been known that two species with the same needs cannot exist in the same environment. So if you take all the photosynthetic bacteria and put them into one group, that is not going to happen. And besides, we have a different, the same needs of photosynthetic activity and nitrogen fixation at different times of the year. So by doing this, uh, nothing worked. So instead, we clustered by blooming period. So we said, when are, which bacteria, bacterial species, OTU species are blooming at the beginning? So this is a two year thing here. So this is maybe in, in April, this is maybe in June and so on. And so we did that and clustered by the blooming period where they are most abundant and the abundance is changed dramatically uh, in, in all these species. By doing that, we created what we called subcommunities. And I call SC as subcommunities. So the subcommunities contain various numbers of species 
could be a very few, could be 10, 20, it could be 150. And they all sort of have the same annual profile. <clears throat> now, ultimately, this, this is a result slide already. So the, the red dots are the means of the observations over the six or seven or eight years. And then ultimately we compute ensembles of models and we look at these ensembles and we and see what's the max and minimum of each ensemble at a given time point and those are the gray curves and can, you can see so these are model predictions already or model inferences let, let's say so we can do that uh, here's for we have 14 subspecies for lake mendota and also 14 for lake lanier and then we have of course measurements on temperature ammonium nitrate nitrite and so on Here's the same thing for Lake Lanier, and you can see there the red dots. Those are the actual measurements. The gray are the model predictions. The, the blue are actually predictions that were not uh, used, the data point that were not used for the model inference, and you can see they are doing fairly well. So we can make long-term predictions, 10 years. Of course, we can attest them <coughs> at this point. But for this one year, for instance, it, it works quite well. Now, what are the features of these sub-communities? Sub um, oops, sorry, I need to go back one. So we have over 18,000 species in both cases. <clears throat> in Lake Mendota, there are, uh, consists of about 63 phyla, but only seven of these phyla account for 93 to almost 100 percent. Why is there a range? Well, it changes during the seasons. At different times of the year, these phyla account for maybe 93 percent or 99 percent of the total biomass. At the same time, each of these subcommunities that we look at contains OTUs from a broad range of taxonomic groups. So that's not surprising for, uh, because what we discussed earlier, each subcommunity has to execute uh, similar or the same tasks during different times of the year. So there's still a need to do photosynthesis, there's still a need to do nitro nitrogen fixation and so on. So if we look at that, so here are some of the dominant species, the seven, and you can see uh, about in January, about 50%, and here 40%, 100%, almost are just these two species. And then it changes throughout the year. And uh, now we can say, what does it mean? And, and we can interpret that in terms of biological function. We can also now look at individual OTUs. So we model the interactions of one OTU against the subcommunities the other subcommunities. Within the subcommunities, we cannot make any statements because they're all treated the same. They're all doing the same thing. And so some of these uh, predictions are quite nice. You can see over a period of two years, we have the observed um, uh, abundances, the red dots, and when we have annual predicted values, the, the green lines, so that works fairly well. Not always, so here's a difference. There's some differences, but this is rough and tumble because this is taken right out of the lake. We can also look at how these communities interact, and this is for Lake Mendota, and you can see the green are positive interactions, the red are negative interactions, and the interaction structure changes from January through December. We're the same for Lake Lanier, and you can see the, the thickness are the prevalences of the different communities, and you can see it goes around all the way, and here's December, and it hooks up with January again, and then we have uh, positive interactions, negative interactions. Now, we can also look at the environmental influence now, and in Lake Mendota, most communities, subcommunities are positively affected by environmental conditions. In Lake Lanier, the effect is not so important. Why is that? Well, because here, for instance, the temperature changes drastically between winter and summer, whereas here in, in Lake Lanier, 
you know, the, the difference are there, but they are not that dramatic. So we can uh, look at, um, we compute our ensembles. So how do we do this? So we do some uh, linear regression with these models, but we have some constraint on it. And every time we put in a constraint, we get uh, a different solution of our linear regression pro uh, task, but we can do it many, many times. And so we get ensembles of models that all fit and all have essentially the same SSE. And now we can look at patterns in these models, in these parameterizations. And so we can see here, these are the, the environmental terms. And uh, so they are affected positively. Here it's about almost a third as strong as in Lake Mendota. Now more interesting are the interaction parameters. The interaction parameters are these alpha ij's. And what do they mean? So if alpha ij is negative and alpha ji is negative, it means they are both competing with each other. Here you have a positive effect of one on the other, a negative effect of B on A. Positive effect of A on B, negative on, on B on A. If, if there's a plus, then we have commensalism. So these sp species uh, benefit from each other because one, for instance, one species is excreting something that the other species can take up and use. And so here we see real differences. So the competition in Lake Mendota is much, much higher. So we have about 75% are in this minus minus competition realm, whereas in Lake Lanier, it's only about 40%. Whereas in the South, uh, they play nice. So there's commensal is about 50%. Lake Mendota is only 20%. These, um, these types of results are very, very difficult to get um, if you don't have these types of models because the interaction models and network models cannot spit this out and it is dependent on these parameters which are retrieved for the entire year. So most of this work was done by Ann Dam. Here's my collaborator Kostas Konstantinidis. He's a chemical and uh, a civil environmental engineer. Here are my postdocs and we had funding and here's a summary. So we have very large diverse microbial communities. In fact, in Lake Lanier, we have something like a thousand viral types, not really species, viral types. In these two lakes, we have between 10 and 20,000 OTUs, around 18,000. We have time series, which are very, very um, valuable because they show us how things, how interactions change throughout the year. So this is right now the best of the best in terms of of data. If we use static networks, we would not capture the dynamics and the asymmetry. Here we use lotka voltaire models and we include environmental conditions. And uh, we can look at the interaction parameters and each parameter by itself is maybe not so important, but if we look at the patterns, we see very different patterns in the two lakes. We need to understand those patterns in the future because they are sort of the drivers of the dynamics of these lakes. And if we want to know what the design principles are that govern these lakes and other communities, we need to know those things. So in the future, we need to do comparison of more lakes. We are now starting a study on soil with similar methods and um, hopefully get some ideas of these interactions, how they change over time. With that, I'm done, and we can have some discussion if you like. Thank you so much for your presentation. And also, uh, thank you again to both speakers um, for speaking at uh, what ended up being an extremely chaotic time. We, we all really appreciate it. Um, okay, so I guess uh, to start, uh, I'd like to open up uh, questions to the audience. Everyone is welcome to uh, un unmute your mic and ask your question, either to one of or ideally both the speakers, or you can type it in the chat and one of the moder moderators will read it out. Well, oh. well uh, I have one question. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for both presentations. They were uh, very nice. But my question is for GL. Um, it's a more technical question. Uh, in your models, when you put together the microbiota and uh, human metabolic models, uh, you, you just built uh, a big fat stoichiometric matrix uh, with interaction between them or uh, they're kind of hybrid model and separate simulations. And my second question is uh, the objective function for the, uh, the FBA to use different uh, objective functions or one main? Okay. Um, for the first question, yes, indeed, we do create a very, very big um, stoichiometric matrix. Um, each microbe for the microbiome level, each microbe remains a microbiome entity. And so they're joined um, within a microbio, shared microbiome compartment through which they can communicate. Okay. And similarly, on exchange uh, metabolites. And similarly, then within the human network, this happens. So basically, the microbes um, can secrete into a luminal compartment or take up from a luminal compartment. And similarly, the diet can go in there or the host can take up or secrete. Okay. So that's a massive um, S matrix, if you want. So the dimensions we're talking about here, it's something between 100 to 300,000 um, columns and rows or um, variables and equations. Um, as for the a way of solving those ones, um, we do um, shoes two different approaches generally. Either we formulate an objective reaction, so basically ask the system to maximize or minimize a particular function within the network. And I showed the example of um, the brain neurotransmitter cap capacity. And there actually the production in the brain of the particular neurotransmitter became an objective. Okay. And so that's why we can, comp that's why I keep the word capacity and it is really a maximum production capacity rather than a real flux. The other approach is that we have in the whole body model a um, whole body maintenance reaction, which accounts for the different um, biomass precursors of the different organs and their fractional contribution to the whole body, which we said to be one maintenance per day. And so um, then we use, or we determine using quadratic programming, the flex distribution that minimizes the Euclidean norm. And we analyze that one. So it's two different approaches, uh, depending on the questions we're really asking. Okay, and did you check it? How, how much influence these uh, assumptions make to your model? There's a large number of assumptions going in and um, different assumptions have different um, effect sizes. We investigated a few of them, um, particularly, um, of course, like the diet, well, the microbiome composition plays a role and that could be sample dependent. We find that, um, so underlying um, the parameterization of the whole body model, are phenomenological models. And for there, again, the different phenomenological models and the parameter that we um, estimate for those ones have different contribution. And one of them that we find is largely contributing as, for example, the blood flow rate, which then determines how much of a metabolite can be um, was available to an organ. Okay. Or for example, oxygen. So there's a lot of parameters that um, have a big effect size, but I think that's also where the personalization comes in. Okay. Where you can really personalize it on an individual person. Uh, okay. Uh, just one more question. Uh, I think uh, we, we should move on.
Kasi nga oh, okay, sa... okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I actually, I, I had a question for uh, both of you. Um, well, do, do, you uh, do you view them being uh, like clinical or technological applications to these models? Um, and if so, uh, how close are these models you know, able to be useful for that? I guess Dr. Thiel probably would be like clinical application for treatment and Dr. Voigt maybe uh, you know, for manipulating lake microbiomes, something along those lines. So you know, do you envision these modeling models having those types of applications? And if so, how close are they to achieving that? Well, I mean, in, in our case, it is uh, sort of the dictum of environmental, environmentalists that a diverse community is a healthy diversity. And if you lose diversity, and that um, the lake in this case may be in trouble. So this is at first a diagnostic tool to see how many species are there and how, how they are interacting. And if we know what the normal interaction patterns are, like in these two lakes, then we can diagnose from water samples whether these uh, systems are actually healthy or whether they are at risk of tipping over. And those tipping points can be very dramatic. I mean, everything can look fine, and then all of a sudden there is something and the entire a community changes in, in composition and in interaction patterns, and that could be very bad. And the same with pollution. So we can, so for instance, Lake Lanier, there's a lot of uh, boat traffic and there's runoff from fields. There's a little bit of industry and so on. And we could say, well, is this really affecting the interaction pattern and the health of this community? And to what degree is it doing that? So it's not manipulating it, it's, it's checking it and, and making sure things are okay. Thanks. Can I butt in there? I, I think another point to, to link the two talks is that uh, uh, these are all microbial systems and probably all microbial systems are running to the same set of rules. Some microbes, microbial systems like lakes are in some ways ethically and technically easier to study than, than the human gut. And so there should be a transfer of you know, what we learn from studying the lake. We should be able to help inform people studying the gut because it's, it's, although they're, they're uh, very different systems, they're, they're probably running to the same set of rules. Yeah, you're right, except that we cannot manipulate the lake either. And if we take samples and try to have them in the lab, it is very, very difficult. So most of these species cannot be cultured and even if you culture them and they are missing 16,000 or 17,000 of their brothers and sisters, you know, the dynamics is probably totally different. So, I, but I agree what we learn in either one of these communities could be useful for, for other applications. So yeah, from our side, um, I think the clinical application per se is the quite some step away. And I think the first potential could be um, along the lines of um, clinical decision support or um, stratification by analyzing a patient's data, or maybe suggesting um, biomarkers. So by the, one of the strengths of these models, I, I think from both um, Dr. Boyd's and ours, is that you can actually in silico investigate and analyze much more scenarios than you can do in real life and real laboratories. And so you can start prioritizing um, experiments that you could do afterwards. And I think for that, the models are already fit for purpose. The next step is then to kind of say, well, you know, bring that really into the clinics and clinical decision support. And beside the models being proven to be uh, correct, at least under certain circumstances, I think there's also a question to be done into how far do we want and will allow clinical decision support to be supporting those kinds of judgments. So it's a completely different question than being just able to do that with the models. Thank you.
Can, can I ask you Nate a question? Sure. Uh, 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 when you're parameterizing the 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 uh, metabolic models for the bacteria, how are you coping with the fact that lots of the genes are, are unannotated, and so for some of the genomes, you just don't know what it's doing? Yeah. So we can. That's a weakness of our approach. If you don't know what's happening, we can't model it. So we only incorporate what's known um, and for what we have some evidence. So what we generally do is, that's why this experimental data is so important, is we try to find as much as possible about um, a species or at least a general family of what they can do and complement the um, genomic annotations. But um, if there's a feature, that we don't know about, we can't simulate it, and that we might be missing. Um, another reason why a lot of the analysis so far has been focusing on central metabolism, where we have a fairly, or we assume we have a fairly good understanding on what the gene should be looking like. And we have a question from S. Andrews posted in the chat. So to Dr. Voigt, can you speculate on why the difference in amounts of commensalism versus, or why there are differences in amounts of uh, commensalism versus competition in Wisconsin compared to Georgia? Yeah, these why questions are always very difficult. Um, one obvious reason is that the geographic conditions are very, very different. And so you have um, very harsh condition in the winter in, in Wisconsin, whereas in in Georgia, it is quite mild in the winter. Even even if we have some snows and some temperatures below zero, it is still a difference between that and having you know um, ten or twenty degrees below. Um, so it could be that this harsh environment triggers stronger competition, but it's pure speculation. So we, we just don't know, we observe it. And that's what I said at the very end, we need to have many, many more comparisons of this type so that we see which types of patterns or behaviors correlate with certain environmental features or the human impact on those environmental systems or, or other things. Only then, I think, can we formulate hypotheses of what is causing these differences. And, and then if we can formulate those, then there may be a chance of testing them and you know refuting them or accepting them. But that's a good question. Thank you. If I can maybe um, uh, barge in here, I think this is where the approach that Professor Thiele outlined would be really useful of having toolboxes to make such models publicly available yeah. so that then people could adapt it for for different lakes that they work on for instance um, yeah. and then create basically a population of of lake models that could be used for comparisons that is so that true yeah. yeah so we have our models in, in github and things but uh, it's we don't have a toolbox for this aspect we have toolboxes for the bioinformatics aspects of these lakes, but not of the, the modeling aspects. All right, well, Can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, so I have another question about the lakes. Um, if you were to model the effects of climate change, yeah. do you think that that would just be the same model with increased temperatures or do you think it's, it's more complex than that? Again, that's a very good question. We have actually made some predictions of what happens if the temperature goes up by <clears throat> some relatively minor amount, but we only did it for a period of about 30 days and said, if we have this change uh, over 30 days, what's the effect? And that uh, the effects actually depend on when this change is, at one season it is. And, but the population at this point tolerate that quite well. Now, if we have a permanent change, then we can make predictions. That, that's no problem. The question is how good are they? Because we can validate them. You know, this is shooting in the dark and we can say we can take our model immediately 
and uh, increase the temperature profile by, let's say, one degree or two degrees Celsius throughout the year, or make milder winters and, you know, rainier summers and stuff like that. We can make predictions, but we cannot validate them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Good question. All right. I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, especially a big thank you to both of our presenters for coming under such crazy conditions. Um, I hope everyone stays safe, and uh, I hope I hope to see you all next month, um, where the topic is going to be whole cell modeling. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you very much.